Great. Okay, so I'm ready for everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we have an exciting uh, talk today, and we're, we're happy uh, to be hosting uh, uh, Professor Peter Wonka, uh, who's a uh, professor in the computer science department at House, and also the director for the Visual Computing Center uh, at uh, King Abdullah University of uh, Science and Technology. Uh, professor Wonka has done tremendous research and has led tremendous research in various areas. Main research interests including uh, computer vision, computer graphics, remote sensing, image processing, uh, and, and different fields that are related to, to vision. Uh, they, the, the group also tackles a very interesting research topic related to 3D shape analysis, generative models, which is the core of today's talk. In today's talk will be here about building 3D GANs. Uh, that's generative and resilient net networks. We're happy to host uh, Professor Wonka here. And the floor is open. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we'll talk about uh, 3D GANs or 3D aware GANs in this talk. And that will mainly give a history of uh, one particular aspect, mainly focusing on the generator. To start at the very beginning, um, the most popular neural network layers to build neural networks are fully connected layers or the linear layers that computes the matrix vector multiplication AX plus B. So these are one fundamental building block that is everywhere. And the other uh, very popular layer is the convolutional layer of just const 2D, const 3D, which are 2D and 3D convolutions. Money convolutions are also there, but they're not used in uh, this talk. In the last two to three years, most new work used the attention or self attention layers, but in this talk, go way back in time, and more, almost all the layers you see, I think actually all, maybe all, uh, are fully connected layers and are convolutional. Now, one idea, and this is called the nerve representation, but uh, it's really not clear what exactly this uh, nerve representation is, because there's so many times people say, oh, this is nerve, or this is nerve, so what exactly is it? So it may be a more general term, the nerve is the term a neural field. So we will use both terms. It's a bit sloppy, we'll say nerve or neural. And the idea is to build a neural network. Uh, to build a neural network that encodes a volume. So the function f has its input x, y, z anywhere in space and as output you get a density. And this type of representation would be good. This is typically for a medical scan, you get this type of volume representation. And the idea now is that typically this would be stored in a regular grid, in a 3D grid. But what we can do instead, this is this neural fields idea, we can use a neural network to encode this function instead of using the regular grid. So this function that you get three coordinates as input x, y, z, you get the density out. This is now encoded as a neural network itself. And then there's a bit of an extra uh, idea that for each point in space, and you can imagine it's like a a cube space somewhere, we want to represent objects, particularly the prime example of human faces. Um, 
we also not only want to have density, but we also want to have color RGB. So, uh, and this color is a bit tricky. There's this theta and omega, which means that the color can be view dependent, but this may or may not be the case. So I uh, will just have it here for completeness, but you could just imagine that X, Y, Z. Uh, in addition, there's another function that gives you a color for each point in space. So this is the original architecture, and we will see this one being used over and over again. Where uh, this 256 means these are the fully connected linear layers that have 256 outputs. And so this is now this blue part here, all these linear layers are basically the encoding of this density and of the of our color. And so uh, when you go to this, can you stand up actually? So when you go to this uh, sigma here, then this is the density that you get this output. And then there's this extra part here where you get the RGB result. And the input, why does it say 60? We don't have three, we have three inputs, but there's a positional encoding with signs and cosines that is standard. And this positional encoding is used as input instead of just the X, Y, Z. Now, this is the type of uh, result that you can get with a 3D aware GAN. And uh, this got really popular in this year, 2022, many papers about it. And so you can see that the uh, quality, this is one example, is quite uh, fascinating because this 3D representation is learned without any 3D. So the input is just a large data set of two dimensional images, typically face images, let's say 100,000 faces, and as an output, you get a trained network that can generate a random face, but in 3D, in this volumetric representation, part of it. And almost all 3D aware generators at the moment, that means up until September uh, this year, uh, now diffusion is also a big player, are uh, GAN based. And uh, they typically have the following structure. You input some noise, you go to a 3D generator. That's what we discussed this nerve type. Then we will look at other variations, but this nerve neural field representation we showed before, this is a very popular backbone for the 3D generator. Then there's a volume. And this volume is handed over to a rendering algorithm that generates a 2D image of this volume. And this, can imagine this is cube, and you can really set the camera anywhere in space and you can look at this volume from anywhere and generate a 2D image. But this 2D image is not generated at full resolution with this rendering algorithm, but at lower resolution. And then there's an additional upsample. So this lower resolution image can be anywhere from 32 square to 128 square. And then the 2D generator upsamples this a bit with a traditional 2D GAN to get the final output. And the final output can be typically it's from 256 to 1024. The differences are the structure of the generator. It could be with conf 3D or what we looked at this nerve neural field in the beginning or uh, science distance field based. Uh, many variations. And a lot of work that will look at is designing this company. And there are also different ideas how to make sure that this 2D generator does not mess up the 3D structure. Because the 2D generator is more powerful and more clever than the 3D generator. So the 2D part has the power to throw away everything the 3D part does and completely overwrite it. And then you do have a 3D model, but the output looks nothing like the 3D. So there have to be these uh, constraints. And 
but all of them employ a traditional image-based discriminator. We'll not talk about the top discriminator. Now, this was an exciting paper in 2019. That's maybe the start of these recent papers. It was called Hologram, and it could generate these like, current standards like a lot lower quality uh, models, but it was still a pretty good start. And you see that even though there is 3D consistency, the models still change and deform a bit. And what they did was, maybe it's like really a leading thing for the generator. It's, it's similar to um, style game one, uh, which is more a traditional convolutional network. Where, you know, if you're not familiar with style game one, you can imagine it's similar to PGG, just maybe annoying, uh, but, but inverted so that it goes from small resolution to high resolution. And it uses these comp 3D layers now to produce a voxel grid. And uh, the voxel grid is then rotated and projected onto a 2D plane with an MLP. So they didn't have the fancy hard coded rendering that is more physically accurate that we have now, but a very simple cartographic projection. And the 2D representation is then also upsampled. So this falls exactly into the structure we discussed first, the 3D part, then the 2D. Okay, this is just the traditional discriminator. Let's look at it here. So um, <clears throat> other in is a typical block on how to get extra information into a convolutional layer. So this set is the noise, and you somehow need to have different uh, outputs. Uh, so uh, this set the noise, make sure that sometimes, you know, that this could be woman or man, long hair, short hair, different races. Uh, so the Z controls how the final result looks like. And um, this is input with this Alain. And so you will see Alain is a popular block to do that. Uh, I'm sure if you're familiar with it, it's, it's, it does something similar to scaling then activation maps the different channels. And then you see the 3D uh, convolutions at the beginning, this comp 3D. Uh, then you can rotate to so change the camera. And then there's the 2D projection and the 2D block. So this fits the structure we discussed. Um, 3D transform rotates the box grid, and then the projection does the 3D tensor to 2D tensor. At the beginning, the yellow part is the 3D part, the green part is the 2D. Uh, graph, uh, I see some results here. Uh, also, still quality is, is very amazing uh, going through the history, not as good as it is now. But if you look at the cat at the bottom, you see already the same issue that plagues all these 3D GANs. The 3D structure does not come very naturally. And often the generator tries to cheat and still just generate a flat image with a face or cat on top, and it hopes that the air it makes the rotating a bit is not too big. You can see that a bit with these cats. So the generator structure is this learn for exactly what we discussed before, but there's this conditioning. They have this idea of how can we insert noise in this nerve model we discussed. It uses proper volumetric rendering, and the discriminator structure is also a classical one taken from another paper. And one of their ideas is that they not, they're not always, because the discriminator judges an image, but they don't send the whole image. So you see the white part is the part of the image it's sent to be judged to be discriminator. And so sometimes it's a small patch and sometimes it's a large patch with, with many pixels missing. So you see the white, if it's really the whole image that is sent, then there's a large space in the pixels. So uh, this is the whole image of the uh, graph model. And then this part, G theta, pointing, let's go stand up. Now this again is this NERF model we discussed. This generates the 3D uh, volume that represents a face. 
And then you have these ideas that this is just two different noises, one's for structure, one for appearance. And you see that uh, this part, this is the rendering that uh, generates the images from this 3D model. And here, the rendering happens by casting a ray through the volume and sampling the volume at many places. And these are kind of a lot of these are camera parameters that say, how is the 2D image generated from the 3D? So Shiraf, getting better and better, some synthetic uh, 3D scenes here. And the main idea, look at here, is that the 3D generator is object decomposed. That means this one nerve representation doing one volume. What we are doing now is we're doing multiple of these volume. So there has to be a fixed number. So they say we have n different volumes. So we can do n different objects. That's what we saw before this, this cone and the box. So each of them can be a different volume and they want to generate many of these volumes. So n nerve models now instead of simple extension. Essentially, before there was only one of these neural fields, and now we do many. And then the features are rendered instead of colors to a 2D feature map. And so in the traditional volume rendering, people render an RGB volume and generate an RGB image. But what people found out is more powerful is you can render a volume with many features, let's say 32 features per voxel. You could think of it as 32 magical colors that only the computer understands, only the AI understands, but it has a lot more information about the location space. This is being rendered. And then uh, this 2D information is a lot more powerful for upsampling because now you have these 32 magical AI colors rather than only three RGB. So this 2D feature map is passed to a 2D generator. And the multi view consistency is a problem because, again, I always did really again struggle with the 2D generator overriding what the 3D generated. Okay, again, some custom based CNN, not, not really clear. And this was the best paper at CDPR, which is the biggest computer vision conference in the year 2021. So after reading this paper, there was like so many people said, oh, we want to do this uh, just like a little better. And then we also want to get the best paper award next year. So then at CDPR 2022, there were 10 papers very similar that tried to beat Shiraf. And so the main thing I just want to highlight, because we started with this nerve representation. So each of these ones is now this nerve neural field representation, and then all of them together. The At the same time as Shiraf, there was another paper uh, called Pagan that was also very nice, and uh, also last year's CDPR. And uh, again, you can see quality is actually a lot higher than in the beginning already. So um, what they did, similar to Graph, so uh, what they tried to do is for this nerve backbone we discussed, they try to have something similar that is this other in for uh, convolutional layers. We'll see that how it looks like. They use progressive growing, that means they use low resolution generated first and then try to do higher and then higher and then higher. Um, and then they have some, uh, they use the Stigen 2 discriminator. And Stigen 2, at this point in time, is the best two-dimensional GAN still that is available. So they, a lot of people actually just try to borrow this discriminator. So what you see here is these are linear layers as we discussed in the beginning for the nerve pipeline, but they have this beam siren box, this is this red box, which allows you to insert some of this noise into the linear image and to generate different types of water. 
Steiner, SIPs with 3D. So they use uh, something similar to graph again that we looked at to generate a low resolution image. And then they upsample it with this Steiner 2, which we discussed is the best 2D GAN. And uh, they achieve high image quality. But again, there's an issue with this multi view consistency so that the face, if you look at your head, you look at it from the right or the left, it's not exactly the same. So one thing to look at with multi-view consistency, what you can notice when the head turns, the eyes actually don't look in the same direction, but they often follow the camera. So this is maybe something for the next examples that you look at. Maybe you can see how well this can be done. Is the eyes, do the eyes follow the camera or do they not follow? So this is 6 uh, 3D. And this one, the camera path is required to judge. And uh, you see also they could do some, let me try it again, could even do some uh, uh, 3D effects for classical portrait. Now, Graham, this is one model that has really nice image quality that is uh, like many. And um, so here, this looks very nice. Very nice again. And so, what they did is they borrowed from Pygan, but they actually have a separate, what they call manifold predictor M to define where the volume should be same. So, if you want to know the color of a single pixel in the 2D image, you need to trace a ray to the volume and maybe sample 128 or 256 more times in the volume. This takes a long time. Every pixel is a lot of work. And so what they try to do is they try to have fewer locations, but they try to learn these locations. It's actually very amazing that such a complicated architecture can work. And these samples are not unique for every model. They are the same for the whole data. And then during training, they need to figure out where to place the samples, but then uh, eventually at inference at the end, they can do this faster because then they keep this fixed and they just call and generate samples and only sample points on these isosurfaces. So this is a mixture between volume and surface rendering. Discriminator, again, not this square, but maybe similar to Sargan 2. And here, to give you one idea, you know, how this training is not cheap, it's one week on eight P100 GPUs for 256 squares. All right, let's do this. So, this is the gram structure. And again, to point this out, this is like in 2D. And so, what you see here is the rendering process. Here would be the camera point that's placed here. Then, for each pixel, you trace a ray through the to trace a ray through the volume. And then usually you would have to trace, let's say many, many, many points. But here they try to predict where to sample. So these black lines are kind of the isosurfaces, surfaces where the samples are placed. So you see here now only on these, I mean, this kind of, they have more than that, but here you show only like five samples of these. But, but where these isosurfaces are, this is being learned by this block here, what they call the manifold generator, that learns where the high surface is. So there's some uh, maybe how to exactly learn that. They actually do some fixed sampling during training and then interpolate. So you can see that drawn at the bottom because it's not easy to make this differentiable. This is the thing. How can you make it differentiable so you can actually train this? And so they have this idea of density sampling, and then they compute this the S values in the So this is the architecture. And then 
going back to where we started was the idea of um, nerve with linear layers. And then Pi again had this idea of these film siren blocks where you could add uh, extra information like noise into these linear layers. And then the other part here, you see a lot of the style get two architecture. So we didn't really show the style get two architecture a lot, but maybe I'll highlight one particular uh, aspect, which is this one here. And what you see, this is again, just linear layers stacked on top of each other or fully connected layers with a leaky velo activation function. And what you want to do is a noise vector set. You want to transform that into a more fancy noise vector W, where uh, W is a better space to uh, manipulate and uh, to, to is a better space to inject into these uh, linear layers. And the other part here is also a part that's a bit fancy from the Salian architecture where not only one image is generated at the end, but they, they kind of try to generate outputs at many different layers and then add the marks on it. So um, <clears throat> the left part here, you can recognize just another very standard fully connected network, just linear layers. And then there's this manifold generator that tells you where the isosurfaces are. So let's see where does the model learn to put the isosurface. So for the initialization, typically these are just concentric spheres. So you see that on the top left with the faces, but then for the faces, it actually learns to put the isosurfaces in planes. It's almost just like parallel planes. That's the bottom. That's what is learning. And for the Cat, it's similar. The isosurfaces look fairly plain like, also because the viewpoint is mainly from the trunk. But for the cars, you see it, it's much more like some ellipsoids around the car because the cars can really be seen with the data set from all different sides. Here's some visualization of how does this look like uh, when we just focus on what does each particular isosurface show us? And what does each particular isosurface contribute to the final output? And this is shown here. This is kind of the one particular face, one particular cat sliced for these isosurfaces. So Graham, again, Graham has very high quality samples, but they did have some problem, mm -hmm. which is that the main method to evaluate ANS is to use this metric, which is called the FID. And FID, what it does is it compares the, all the images generated, all the synthetic images generated with all the training images in the data set. And in general, if you have better FID, in general, your method is better. But for this particular paper, the results look really good, like really, really good, one of the two best. But the FID scores are much lower than what other competing papers in the same period. And that's maybe one reason why this particular model was not at the end, the most popular one. But the results look really good for this one. That's what turned out to be the most popular model now. That is called EG3D, Efficient Geometry 3D GAN. And so what you see on the left, and again, the image is generated, and on the right, you see the 3D structure that is being learned. And the amazing thing again is that there's no 3D supervision. There's not a single 3D face being inserted into the training. 
it only learns it from the 2D views, only from 2D images. And also the quality is very good. It's also 512 times 512 compared to 256 times 256. And um, the quality also looks very good. But this one, it has much better FID scores. And also it has the best FID scores among all, let's say all published papers, especially at this point. So what do they do? It's a 3D generator that has a new 3D representation that became very popular in many other contexts. Um, it's kind of a new representation for a 3D volume and people used it afterwards uh, for many different volume uh, 3D vision classes. We'll look at this. So, and then it does some regularization for the 2D synthesis network to preserve multi-view consistency. You will also see that. So this is this novel, it's called a triplane representation for 3D shapes. And the nice thing about this is it can be generated by a 2D generator. So you take a 2D generator to generate a 3D representation. And it just happens that, and it's unclear, either the representation is so good or the 2D generator from StyleGAN is just so good that using this 2D generator from StyleGAN, even though it's not really a great fit, uh, but it can maybe compensate and still generate amazing 3D. We cannot do view-dependent effects, and actually this, they, they might just do uh, not, right? just every color is not. And discriminate again, it's stuck again too. So uh, still, I think at the moment, there, there will be a slight variation of it discussed shortly. And so here training takes 8.5 days for five, well, square resolution. But again, this is on, I think on eight, you want to have So what you see here is this uh, triplane representation and how this works. Uh, so this encodes the volume. Then on top of this triplane representation, there's a small MLP. You could imagine it as a mini nerve, mini neural field. And then this is being volume rendered at 128 square here. And then um, is 128 squares upsampled to 512. So this is the 2D part. This is purely with 2D convolutions. But how can we make sure that this small 2D part and this large 2D part is similar? And so here, what they do is they give both of these images to the discriminator to make sure that the 2D part doesn't change the small image that comes from the 3D parts too much. So how does this uh, representation work? So this is the triplane here to the right. What you see to the left is nerve, what we started with is exactly the network I showed you in the beginning. This is the nerve neural field. And here what you do is you again want to know what are the features for one particular position in space, anywhere in space. So this, for example, this particular red point here. And what you do now is you take this red point and you project it onto this one plane, you project it onto this second plane, and you project it onto this third. And then each of these plans, you do interpolation, bilinear interpolation, and get the features. So this is the position in 3D space. We project it to get in, in dark red, and then we get these three positions in 2D space, in light red. And then we get three times, let's say, something like uh, 12 or 36 dimensional, 24 dimensional features, or maybe 72 dimensional. There's different ways to configure. And then these features, you can concatenate, or in this case, what they did is add them together. 
and then you have another uh, fully connected, a few fully connected layers, just two is like. Now, in some sense, this is a weird representation because it's not a real 3D grid, what we would expect, but it's more than a 2D grid. It's kind of like three 3D grids, uh, three 2D grids stuck together. And so uh, it's not really clear that this representation worked so well, but it somehow does work really well. There's also what they what they did is they use this for the traditional 3D reconstruction problem. So you have 100 images, let's say, and you want to reconstruct the 3D object. So for example, this statue here, and what they showed is that, again, for this is where the nerve representation we saw away in the beginning comes from, it was to represent 3D shapes for just shape reconstruction. Okay. And so you see this is maybe the, these are some more traditional nerve representations that when you do 3D construction, this gets more blurry, the text of the statue. And then here uh, with this triplane representation, this gets better. And so what the authors argued is that there's some thing about this triplane representation that seems to be really good for encoding 3D shapes in general, not only for, um, for doing things. So we also use this triplane representation for a surface-based reconstruction algorithm where we can do um, 3D reconstruction from many images, which is a very classical task in computer vision. And we could improve the state of the art by using this triplane representation and then building a bit on top. And so here you can see the eyes maybe, uh, and it, they don't follow the camera too much, but they still look towards the camera when the face turns more than they should. And Still, this, this is an amazing piece of work that uh, got a lot of people really excited. Um, there is this idea that in the end, we don't know are the people genius implementers or genius designers? Because in many ways, the wheel keeps turning, right? Maybe EG3D is actually quite similar to Hologan with what we started, it's maybe just a triplane instead of a voxel-based one, volumetric rendering instead of projection, and then they use this style and two back home. Maybe just style and two got better, they have better blocks. Uh, it is a hard thing to say in uh, deep learning in general. Is your implementation great or is your design? They have also these regularization tricks like this concatenation of high-res and low-res images, and then conditioning the discriminator on a camera pose. This is like some detail we also mainly skipped in this talk, but uh, that kind of helps to maybe combat some of these view-dependent problems. Some more highest quality samples of EG3D. In some sense, so this looks very amazing. And all these, things like two years ago, no one thought that this would be possible. People saw whole again and said, it's, it's like a nice idea, but it just doesn't really work. And you see that within three years from whole again, just this initial idea, it's like, it doesn't really work. People got to this much more amazing quality, just improving, improving, improving with uh, three, four or five iterations. I find this is like a huge achievement, really amazing. Also what you see here is now that the FID score is quite low. This is what you want, is 4.7. Now a tricky part is that 
uh, the FID score you need to almost remember for every different rhythm. So if you want to know the state of the art GANs, you need to know the FID score for 256, 512, 1024, uh, and then what's the state of the art. And so this is the best 3D word. It's not as good as uh, 2D GANs, which 2D GANs can go below 3 for this data set. Now there's another idea for that is called IDE 3D. They take EG 3D and build on top of it. And their main idea is to have a segmentation branch. So they not only generate a 3D volume of density and color, they also generate a 3D volume of label maps that says, where's the hair? So you see these segmentation maps is insets. Maybe the hair is blue. The face is red and the neck is orange, and they generate these 3D segmentation maps in a separate branch. So the generator, and, and so again, it's just to say where this idea came from. So a very similar idea was proposed by SoftGAN for 2D GANs, and it worked well. And so what they did is they said, okay, we EG 3D plus the segmentation map of 3D GANs, so hopefully also works well. And it does work. So we will see we will see what what they what they do. So the they they basically do this uh, similar to EG3D with the segmentation branch. And so what you see here is that um, they have this uh, triplane uh, representation similar to before. That's, that's actually like a, a triplane here. And um, this is the color triplane from EG3. But now they use a side branch. And so when you take this part, so you think of it as this part, this gray part, and then going into this part, this gives you the color triplanes. But just taking this stump, the first part of this network, this gives you these semantic triplanes that generate the text, the, the semantic segmentation features. And then they do volume render also the semantic segmentation features to get a 3D uh, to 2D translation. So the 3D segmentation volume becomes a 2D segmentation image. And then they also feed that to the discriminator and they can learn the 3D segmentation by only 2D supervision. So the same idea of getting 3D geometry from 2D images, they do 3D segmentation from 2D segment. Without seeing any computation. I think they, they do it um, by, by distilling the, the 2D segmentation. Or they may train. Or oh, maybe they, they train. The pre-train network? Yeah, I think there's a pre-train network. I actually need to double check now. Uh, either pre-trained or they train on that. Pre train on a data set that, like this. Uh, this is Celeb. They, they have like Celeb HQ maps uh, where they can pre train. So, just some other names, it gets too many. So, the, there's this idea of having representations because the nerve neural field representation it's not good at creating clean surfaces. There are some regularized volumes. There's just maybe a regularizer and some, some transformation uh, that comes from ball SDF or, or um, MUSE. These are also papers from last year's MIRIPS where they have this idea to represent this volume as a sine distance field. So now then adding this sine distance field idea, you also get uh, some out. And so then finally, uh, if we look at what we worked on, it's my student that is named on the first slide. His idea was that it's very difficult to uh, actually ensure that the 2D generator does not win the 3D part. So can we do 3D GANs only with a 3D part? No 2D upsampling. It just doesn't really make sense. 
the, the only reason people use 2D upsampling is because otherwise it ran out of memory. There's then not a way we can save memory. And so the main idea is to take it, generate the structure similar to EG3D, but not use upsampling. So where can we get the memory from? And so the idea is to take a, 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 a still this general discriminator, but use a patch-based discriminator. And so the patch-based discriminator people tried before, it just doesn't work well enough. And so we developed some ingredients that make this patch taste discriminator. And so the thing is that these patch sizes need to be very carefully distributed over training. So if you have too many small ones, then all the details are good, but the face is completely formed. If you have too many large patches, then all the faces are blurry and the details are not good. So this beta distribution and then carefully tuning it, this is what was one of the main ingredients. There's some other uh, ideas, but uh, I'll leave it at that. So this is the architecture you see the pipelines as well. And then here you see a bit of this careful distribution of patch sizes. And then when you see these distributions, it's really the distribution changes over time, not the patch sizes. So that the distribution uh, shown here, so in the middle and uh, on the right. And so that while training, you always have the chance to sample small and large patches, but the relative proportion of small and large patches changes. So here are some results. And these are some face results. So you see that Ours is on the right, and then Steiner, and then we see again. So we we didn't have the EG3D at the time when it was released, uh, the code. So uh, this is pretty, pretty good and stable results. And these are view consistencies also really good in this model, even though resolution, and it doesn't really go up to 512 because still memory is like, it still takes a lot, even we can gain some of this. And so the latest thing we submitted is Epigraph XL, where we have multiple additional ideas where we can train on ImageNet. Just like for any general object, we want it to have 3D depth. And so here the quality is lower because the task is a lot more challenging, but you really can generate 3D structures out of nothing for a very large way. now. So with that, uh, thanks for your attention. And maybe there's time for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wonka, for this nice presentation overview of uh, three begins. Do you have one question here? Just a reminder for uh, our uh, listeners online, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A. Uh, or just raise your hand so that when you can uh, ask them. I have a question here uh, from Ivan. It says, what are the some of the limitations uh, of using the FID score for specific data sets? Uh, for example, using it for medical data sets of uh, scientific uh, nature. I don't know if using inception B is suitable for a specific task. Just uh, this what do you think of recent attempts of using visual Turing tests to compare them with mean samples into the domain experts? All right. So um, using domain experts is very difficult because you cannot automatically. So it is interesting in the end, but when you're developing again, you need to launch three, four experiments every day. And you need to check after the day, how do my three, four experiments work like? And then the next day you need to set up three, four more. And you don't have an expert that works with you from three in the night, six in the morning, every day to judge which of these three, four experiments work out for you. So um, 
it's good as an additional quality check at the end, very hard for the development. Now the FID score is what it is. Most people use the classical one, but even though they, they, uh, it has a name, uh, uh, inception still in it, people switch out the inception method. So um, the idea is that you have features from the inception network and you just compare the images in this feature space, but the inception network is arbitrary. So some of these recent FID papers, people also look at, can we use other popular networks just to create another feature space? So in particular, one idea was people would use the, um, or what is popular for, for language, they would use the clip space. Just can we use the clip space, for example? And uh, one other issue that is one of the main issues with this FID, you can do different spaces, but several of the GANs and 3D models, not, not only GANs, but Fusion as well, they use classifier guidance. And if you use classifier guidance, for example, you use a classifier built on the inception network, and then you use FID built on the inception network, it's become similar to cheating. Then your FID scores get really good, even though the visual quality doesn't get good. So this is definitely a problem. If you use then the same network, let's say inception network to help you in training. Now for medical images, I don't have the experience, but what we do have some other ideas for general, with unsupervised learning, the concern is always this, that for faces, we want to represent the average faces really well. So we want to have the typical hairstyle, the typical beard, the typical eyes. But in medical images, very often the anomalies are what's, what you're interested in is cancer cells block. And then again, often has the, uh, idea that it says, let's take the most prominent features and throw all the outliers mm -hmm. away. It's just how it seems to work. And that doesn't seem to be a good match for uh, medical images. If you want to generate more of these uh, cancer type of artifacts, then again, my view is it would tend to throw them away. And the FID score would not analyze you enough for them. So the FID score for medical images, I would be afraid it does not check enough about the really capture these algorithms. Thank you uh, for your answer. Uh, do we have any, any questions from anybody here uh, on the line? If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I have a question. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is kind of, um, I know that Microsoft is having these synthetic 3D faces mm -hmm. and they use that in, um, you know, key point detection. Yeah. Of all so this, couldn't you use this kind of GAN to generate points? This is pre-trained network. You can take key points and then throw that into the face key points or key features to make, right? So right. instead of using their synthetic renderer, now mm -hmm. you have an actual human feature. Um, I think the, it, it is uh, unclear. So one thing that needs to be done still is to take the work from, I think this data set can also look at these labels for free that generates the key points in a semi-supervised manner for this. Because when you have the standard 3D again, the key points are not there. But, so you will need to have this key point branch and train it. You can talk about this. And so maybe you can distill it or you can do it in a semi supervised manner because there's a lot of features in the and so maybe you can get that And then you can do it. So it's a very obvious paper that someone is going to write or has already submitted to ICLR or, or CDPR this year. 
So great idea for inventing a paper, but most likely somebody else already has it submitted right now. Uh, my second question is, you, you mentioned this, and it's really remar remarkable that you can get 3D from it's yeah. like totally unsupervised. This is a really nice way of, of getting an unsupervised capability unsupervised. Yeah. Um, do you think this will work in other you know, um, volumes and domains that have volumes? Like they have a lot of work here in APK is in seismic, seismic data and kind of underground, even medical, right? Like small measure things. Do you think you can, like, if you take all the sonar scans and actually build a, a 3D? Reasonable render and why is why are we getting this 3D? Just the data aspect or um oh, of course. So so I I did try to look at the seismic data also with Aranko, but uh, my feeling is that I don't understand yet enough about the seismic data. I was interested to start on it. And actually, see if something like this could work, but I don't understand enough about it. It seems to be something that's not so nice about it. Yeah. But it's in, not colorful. <laughs> but, I, I what, know. but what does make sense, I think, is maybe for the tomography aspect, you could try to learn a variety of feed structures from the 2D projections of the tomography device. So, it would be possible, in some sense, to do this with seismic data, but I don't have a perfect view. But it seems also this is a very good idea. Or scans, medical yeah. scans, right, or slices of the brain. Yeah, I'm always worried about medical scans uh, and the criticism that you'll get, but uh, I would do seismic data first. Maybe to do the same concept, just touch that with the most critical aspects of the And I just like this, this point about 2D giving us 3D and color, and yeah. shape, volume. So I wonder if you can have, if you have enough data on one particular data, a video or something, actually, intent and action, <laughs> some other data. Yeah. Physics. A physics simulation from video, right? Like a form of video from video. Yeah, that's what also so this deformable model. We, we we tried to work a bit on this, but this is a bit tricky. Um, and we didn't get the top uh, results. And um the, the, one of the issues is get this deformable model is to get it semantical and meaningful. You want to have like a, a body that is nicely articulated, not like arm flows somewhat out of the body. So it's a bit tricky. It's part of the Thank you. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we can continue this uh, offline. We have one more question online yeah. before we end the webinar. Uh, it's a follow up question from Ivan as well. What do you think of transport learning applied to generative models using a pre trained uh, FFHQ model to boost FID scores quickly? This has been applied to 3D generators to reduce training time, or does it lead to the thing? So, basically, what has been used recently quite successfully is maybe not, I mean, is this, this particular work of distillation. And so, um, what people did, including us in a recent paper, is you use a pre trained 2D network to generate a lot of 2D data. And then you try to train a 3D generator from this uh, synthetic uh, 2D data. So, this is one thing, maybe the spirit of transfer learning. Um, but to using exactly the weights of uh, of a two D trained network uh, is I don't know what people did that maybe tricky area. I'm not, not sure. It, it seems like there might be a problem. 
using the exact rates. Uh, but so I think that any of these considerations is more common. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, thank our speaker one more time, uh, everyone. And then we have uh, thank you for joining us uh, online. We'll see you in uh, future webinars. Thank you.